So theoretically, humans can survive an asteroid that has the potential to destroy entire planets. It won't be a walk in the park, though. Let's go back in time to 66 million years ago in the late Cretaceous period, the Earth before humans, where dinosaurs were thriving. The plants and animals were rich and diverse. You'd see a T-Rex chasing a Triceratops or the massive Alamosaurus, one of the biggest animals to ever roam the planet, towering over the landscape in Texas. They remember the Alamosaurus, and watch out for the Anosaurus, a living tank swinging its tail like a wrecking ball at any threat. As you're about to enjoy a quiet evening under the stars, a bright new light appears in the sky of the Northern Hemisphere. Now, a new star in the sky doesn't really stand out at first, it's just twinkling like the rest. But give it a few hours, and you'll notice it's getting brighter. Check again the next night, and boom, it's the brightest thing in the sky, outshining planets and even the moon. Then, finally, it horrifyingly outshines the sun. The star was the Chicxulub asteroid, which left a gigantic crater, now called the Chicxulub Crater, in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. The asteroid enters the Earth's atmosphere at a blistering 12.5 meters per second. It blasts through 60 miles of the atmosphere in about 3 seconds. It falls so fast that even the air can't get out of its way. The air gets squashed and heats up to thousands of degrees in a blink before the asteroid even touches the ground. This super-hot air has already vaporized much of the sea where it's about to strike near the Yucatan Peninsula. Then, in a flash, the asteroid smashes into the Earth, screaming over Central America with a loud boom that echoes everywhere. It doesn't just smash the ground, it makes the soil and rock flow like liquid. The asteroid digs a hole so wide and deep that it nearly touches Earth's inner layers and throws up dirt more than 20 miles high. At that exact moment of impact, the asteroid also turns its massive speed and weight into heat. In a split second, it puts so much energy into the Earth that it makes molecules move faster than the surface of the Sun. This massive energy created a giant ball of plasma, a super-hot charged gas that includes bits of vaporized rock. This all shot out at incredible speeds. The shock wave from the impact and the heat turned the Earth around the crash site into gas instantly. This set off earthquakes all around the world. And it's not just the rocks flying around that you need to worry about. As they plummet through the sky, they rub against the air, heating up so much that they set fires all around the world. The heat they give off could be compared to an oven cranked up to its highest setting. This fiery shower causes most of the world's trees to burn down. The entire world is now on fire. Soon, it changes everything in a blink. Dinosaurs were wiped out, making way for mammals to rise. And not only dinosaurs, 75% of species and big creatures disappeared, leaving behind only some small birds and critters. So, how could you, a human, survive something like that? Some animals made it back then. To survive, we need to learn from their resilience. The only birds that survived even in the toughest conditions were the ones nesting safely on the ground. Among the few larger animals that managed to dodge extinction, all had ways to deal with the heat. Some, like certain small mammals, snakes, and lizards, could dig themselves into cooler underground burrows. Others, like crocodiles and turtles, just hid in the water. So, if you're exactly on the other side of the planet when the strike happens and you act super fast, you might just make it. Right now, the impact is about 10,000 miles away, but don't underestimate its power. As soon as you hear the loud boom, head underground as quickly as you can. Be careful because you'll feel the earth shake about 30 minutes later. Hide in a deep cave, preferably with a narrow entrance. It would protect you from the falling debris, and the temperatures underground would be stable. Also, some caves have natural water sources, rivers, or streams. You might also prepare for the not-so-great diet of insects, fungi, or, yum, poor small animals that also seek refuge in the cave system. But it's better than nothing. You also need to be extremely far away from any large bodies of water. Being near the ocean might seem like a safe bet during a massive asteroid impact because the sea can buffer extreme temperature changes. But the earthquakes trigger terrifying tsunamis, even in lakes or fjords. The asteroid's crash sets off not just one tsunami, but many, and they're as tall as skyscrapers. Within an hour, 
colossal waves between 600 and 1,000 feet high hit the Gulf Coast, slamming into places like Mexico and the southern United States and flooding miles inland. These waves are so powerful, they even push rivers backward. These tsunamis continue around coastlines, reaching the east coast of the United States, and six hours later, they hit Europe, Africa, and the Mediterranean. By 15 hours after the impact, there isn't a coastline on Earth that hasn't felt the wrath of these waves. Well, let's say you survived the initial impact somewhere deep underground. But your troubles have only begun. The Chicxulub asteroid strikes a region loaded with sulfur. This sends 100 billion tons of sulfur and an enormous amount of water into the sky. The water vapor forms massive storm clouds. They start to rain acid. In colder places, huge snowstorms bury the land under feet of snow each day. The impact also vaporizes massive amounts of oil, throwing up 150 football stadiums worth of it into the air. This oil turns into a thick black soot in the stratosphere. It coats the earth like black paint, and even when the acid rain calms down, this carbon stays up above the clouds and doesn't wash away. This soot layer blocks out 90% of sunlight, plunging the earth into a cold darkness that lasts for at least three years. The world cools down by about 50 degrees on average. Now, when you finally leave your deep cave, you must look for places where you won't freeze. The only spots spared from the frost are tropical islands like Madagascar, India, which was an island back then, and Indonesia. These places have surviving plants and animals, and they even continue to get fresh water, unlike most of the world. Everything else in the world looks like a huge nuclear wasteland. These tropical islands are safe spots during an asteroid apocalypse, but don't think of them as paradise. These places still only get about 10% of their usual sunlight and barely enough rain to avoid turning into deserts. In this chilly, gloomy setting, most food chains fall apart. If you want to survive, you'll need to bring lots of extra food with you for the next six years at least. Now, some things are lucky enough to survive. Fossils tell us that freshwater ecosystems did well, so staying close to a river or estuary might be your best shot at finding food. You could come across turtles, crocodiles, and some fish. Animals like clams, snails, and small crustaceans that live in the sediment also manage to hang on. And while a bit warmer than everything else, these places are no walk in the park. You'd need to pack warm clothes to have any chance of survival. Now, if we add all this together, the best spot for surviving the Chicxulub asteroid would be Indonesia. It's a mountainous tropical country that consists of several islands. There, you'll find bearable temperatures, a bit of rainwater, and a deep cave for shelter. This could protect you from the falling tectites, the intense heat, and even help you find something to eat in the rivers and lakes. But if you stumble upon any shrew-like creatures while scavenging for food, time traveler, please let them be. It's not clear how many survived the Chicxulub impact, and eating one could have unforeseen effects on the future of humanity. Like, don't eat your great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, right? Some people, like the Andaman Islanders, that's a community living in the Gulf of Bengal, see them as burning torches thrown into the air by forest spirits. Others, like some Australian Aborigines, think they're flaming sticks ridden by shamans. If you ask an astronomer, though, They'll tell you that a comet is a large object made of dust and ice that orbits the sun arguably one of the most famous space objects of this kind is Halley's Comet. It has left a great impact on our history and understanding of these mysterious falling stars. When this comet passed Earth in August of 1835, for example, it was blamed for the New York City fire that kept going for several nights. At the same time, the Seminole Indians in Florida saw the comet's long tail and believed it marked the day they would lose their independence. This comet came back in 1910, and people yet again saw it as a sign of bad luck. In Chicago, people bent over backward to secure their windows to protect themselves from the comet's dangerous tail. Others bought all sorts of gadgets like umbrellas or masks, protecting from comets. But what's so intriguing about this space body? How come it just pops up around Earth every once in a while, and most importantly, is it really dangerous? Halley's Comet is what astronomers call a periodic comet. It visits us every 75 years or so. On rare occasions, some lucky people get to see it twice in their lifetime. 
It last passed Earth in 1986, and it is expected to come back in 2061. Despite this scheduled return, the comet's orbit can't be predicted with precision. That's partly because of the chemical processes happening inside the comet. Halley's orbit may also change due to random interactions with other planets and space objects in our solar system. Its official title is 1 Pierre Halley, and it's named after the English astronomer Edmund Halley. He was the one who studied the reports of a comet nearing Earth in 1531, 1607, and 1682. Based on his calculations, he concluded that these three occurrences had been, in fact, the same comet returning over and over again. He also predicted its return in 1758. Halley's discovery also pointed out that some comets, like this one, orbited the Sun, but their journey was not circular. If you look at it in 2D, Halley's orbit looks like an elliptical wire dangling from the Sun. Sadly, Halley didn't live to see the comet's correctly predicted return, but it was named after him. According to the European Space Agency, the first sighting of Halley's comet dates back to March 30, 239 BCE. Asian astronomers noted it down in the Shuji and Wenxian Chronicles. However, another study claims that we might have first noticed it even earlier than that, during the times of the ancient Greeks. Writings from that period reported a huge meteor that landed in northern Greece, leaving the local population perplexed. It soon became one of the ancient world's most popular tourist attractions, but the authors also noticed a comet in the sky at the time the meteor landed. They also reported the fact that the unusual space object had remained in the sky for about 75 days. Shakespeare himself seems to have written about this comet in his play Asterisk Julius Caesar Asterisk around the year 1600. In this work, he included a now famous phrase speaking of comets as unusual signs, saying, the heavens themselves blaze forth. It wasn't the last time famous writers felt a certain connection with this object. Writer Mark Twain even said in 1909, I came in with Halley's Comet in 1835. It is coming again next year, and I expect to go out with it. Surprisingly, Twain passed away on April 21, 1910, one day after Halley's had emerged from behind the far side of the sun. We got a better look at the comet when it last passed us in 1986. Several spacecraft were sent toward Halley to take samples of the comet's composition. This fleet of spaceships, dubbed the Halley Armada, flew nearby, one of them taking several pictures of the comet's core for the first time in history. We also had much better telescopes to look at the comet as it swung by our planet this time. Based on current studies, there's little to no chance that Halley's comet could actually pose any danger to our planet. Most of the bad things associated with the comet were just fabrications. Even better, comets in general may have made life on Earth possible. Specialists believe that early in our planet's history, collisions with comets brought a significant amount of water here, which helped to form our oceans. These space objects may have also gifted us organic material necessary for the formation of life. Don't confuse comets with asteroids, though. Unlike asteroids, which are small, rocky space bodies also orbiting the sun, comets are mostly made up of frozen ammonia, methane, or water. They contain only small amounts of rocky material. Because of their composition, comets are sometimes nicknamed dirty snowballs. Comets are made of four parts, a nucleus, a coma, a dust tail, and an ion tail. But their nucleus makes up most of their total mass. There are over 3,000 comets that we know of, but astronomers think there may be up to 1 billion of them in our solar system. A comet that is bright enough to be visible from Earth without the help of a telescope is called a great comet. Approximately one great comet can be seen every 10 years or so. People have noticed other comets for millennia. However, scientists have concluded that since comets shed a lot of material each time they orbit close to the sun, their lifespan may be only thousands of years. If you compare that to the age of the solar system, which is for 0.6 billion years, it's a relatively small number. Since these space bodies are still present in the solar system today, there must be a source of comets somewhere out there, otherwise, all comets would have disappeared a long time ago. Another famous comet is named Hale-Bopp. It came very close to Earth in January 1997. The last time it was seen near our planet before that was during the Bronze Age, back in 2000 BCE. This comet is much larger and more spectacular than Halley's. 
its nucleus stretches for up to 24 miles in diameter and can be seen from the surface of our planet with the unaided eye. Comet Borrelly was the second comet to be studied up close by a spacecraft. NASA's Deep Space One approached it in 2001 and gave scientists a detailed report of the comet's black core. This comet is surprisingly lopsided, but the reason for its unusual shape is still up for debate. Halley's comet appears to have formed in the Oort cloud at the outer edges of the solar system, but Borrelly is said to come from an icy cloud of rocks beyond Neptune, which is called the Kuiper Belt. Comet Hyakutate gave us quite the show when it passed just 9.3 million miles from Earth in March 1996. It looked like an ice blue splash with a faint gas tail. This comet amazed astronomers too, as it produced X-rays 100 times more intense than scientists had predicted. A spaceship called Ulysses passed through Hyakutate's tail in May 1996, reporting that it was at least 350 million miles long, that's double the size of any other known comet's tail. The comet Wild 2 was examined by NASA's Stardust spacecraft back in 2004. The probe managed to fly within 147 miles of the nucleus of Wild 2, giving us some of the best comet pictures to date. It was also the first time we got samples of dust particles from a comet. The precious cargo came back to Earth in January 2006. Its aim was to shed light on the conditions under which Wild 2, and the solar system, for that matter, formed those billions of years ago. Wild 2 is about 3 miles in diameter and covered with craters and cliffs. If an asteroid like Apophis hits Earth, we will be destroyed. Massive earthquakes will strike, and tsunamis will flood everything. Apophis is a billion-year-old celestial body that has been in the solar system since its inception. So you might be thinking, well, how likely is it that this giant space stone will collide with our planet in 2029? Well, let's find out, shall we? Apophis is a big, bad asteroid discovered in 2004 by the Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona. Since then, it has proudly held the title of one of the most dangerous asteroids ever located. It's around 1,100 feet wide, which is a bit bigger than the Empire State Building and the Eiffel Tower. Because of how scary it is, it was named Apophis, like the Egyptian immortal creature that was considered to bring eternal darkness and destruction to Earth. Oh boy! In 2021, researchers had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to study this floating rock when it passed near our planet, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, some scientists say that there is a small chance of Apophis hitting the Earth on Friday, April 13, 2029. The Yarkovsky effect is to blame for this, since it can slightly nudge the space rock towards Earth. This effect originates from the uneven emission of thermal photons from a rotating celestial object, resulting in a fascinating force exerted upon it in space. These emitted photons possess momentum and play a pivotal role in shaping the dynamics of the body. The asteroid has two sides, light and dark, just like the moon. The light side faces the sun and is warmer than the dark side, but the thing also turns, so the sides constantly change direction and temperature. This change could be detrimental because it slightly pushes Apophis toward Earth. Unfortunately, nobody knows how the Yarkovsky effect will influence the asteroid's path. On the other hand, during the asteroid's last flyby of Earth in 2021, astronomers used radar to take accurate measurements of its trajectory and confidently concluded that Apophis will safely miss Earth in 2029 by about 20,000 miles. After that, it won't bother us again for at least 100 years. Generally speaking, every 8,000 years, our planet is hit by a falling star with dimensions similar to those of Apophis. The last time we were hit by a slightly smaller meteor was in 2013. A new spacecraft developed by NASA, called OSIRIS-RX, was launched in 2016 to collect samples from another slightly less terrifying celestial body called Bennu. For years later, it finally arrived at Bennu, gathered some samples, quickly said goodbye, and started traveling back toward Earth. The samples were safely stored in a capsule that was dropped in Utah. So far, this has been the most significant sample ever taken from an asteroid. After the delivery, the spacecraft didn't waste any time and started chasing Apophis. Now, OSIRIS-RX has been renamed OSIRIS-APEX and is currently playing tag with Apophis. With some luck, on April 2, 2029, when the asteroid zips close by Earth, 
the spacecraft will reach Apophis and land on it. It will stay on Apophis for 18 months, collecting valuable information and taking thousands of pictures. The asteroid will be monitored with the help of powerful telescopes. At some point, Apophis will get too close to the Sun, and then all the monitoring work will be on Osiris Apex's back. If you live in Europe, West Asia, or Africa, you are one of the lucky people who will have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see Apophis with the unaided eye. It'll be visible in the sky in these regions in 2029, and those with telescopes will be able to spot it once again in 2036. Osiris Apex will experience some problems because the asteroid has a thick crust, making it difficult to collect data as easily as it did with Bennu. Osiris Apex has a unique thruster that will blow dust off Apophis while landing, giving it a perfect chance to analyze the asteroid's surface and determine its composition. The spacecraft will spend one and a half years mapping the asteroid and trying to detect changes in its shape. All this research will show how the celestial body is likely to move so we can better design plans to protect Earth from such objects. In 2025, NASA is also going to launch the mission Apophis Pathfinder, which will be the first spacecraft to ever touch this asteroid. It will land approximately a year after its launch. Additionally, NASA has proposed sending a swarm of tiny craft into space to help humanity develop effective protective tactics against asteroid strikes. We know that Apophis originated in the primary asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Over the past million years, this celestial body has changed its path due to Jupiter's considerable gravitational influence. Now, it seems to favor the Sun more, meaning this asteroid will come very close to Earth. That's why it's classified as a near-Earth object. A lot of tests and research have been done to find ways to deal with asteroids. Some solutions include drilling into them, detonating them from the inside, or testing new technologies like attaching rockets to steer them away from Earth. We could also hit them with something moving at high speeds to change their course. Apophis is an S-type asteroid made of rocks and minerals like iron and nickel, and it is shaped like a peanut. Studying it can tell us a lot about the past and possibly the future. Sampling this space object could reveal how life on Earth began and how plants appeared. There are many theories that suggest that water arrived on our planet on an asteroid or comet. Asteroids are like priceless time capsules. Unlike rocks on Earth, which have undergone thousands of changes like erosion, most celestial bodies are still intact and much easier to study. When meteors fall on Earth, they get covered in debris that's impossible to clean, making studying Apophis while it's still in space so important. Some asteroids are even made of precious metals like platinum. Currently, there is a high demand for metals used in production, and mining them on Earth is quite tricky. Just one large meteor might contain iron, nickel, gold, and platinum that could last us millions of years. If Apophis has this amount of metals, we would want to break it down and bring it back to Earth. One space rock could be worth quadrillions of dollars, making space mining highly profitable. However, it would cost more to bring it back to Earth than to dig up these materials here. As technology progresses and new types of rockets are developed, this might become possible at some point. So, even though we're safe from Apophis for the next 100 years, you probably still want to know what would happen if something like it did impact Earth. Well, first, let me tell you that you would hear the sound of the collision and know what happened, even if you're miles away. You should leave your house or apartment immediately. Shortly after the impact, massive earthquakes would strike and many tall buildings would collapse. So, staying away from cities might be your best option if you have a choice. But don't try to escape by car because there will likely be massive traffic jams.